So firstly, thank you for the invitation to share our experiences. Thank you to thank you for the opportunity for, uh, to share this uh, our experiences in Sinaloa in sharing, conserving um, phytogenetic materials. And so I'd like to speak about the way in which we conserve biodiversity, native biodiversity, and why. Do I have this title on maize? Well, in Sinaloa, well, Sinaloa is, is well known around the world for several different reasons. But what I would like to say here is unfortunately not very well known. We are known for different reasons. Nevertheless, these experiences are very important. So hopefully I can change my slide. It says Valerio. So just uh, to introduce the context, here we have we can see Mexico, the map on the screen, and you can see the state of Sinaloa, which is in red here in the west, and in Sinaloa, corn is a very important crop. It is sown in two different ways. There is the hybrid way and the native form of corn, and uh, there is a lot of technology used in the more industrial method and high productivity, but then we also have the other modality where which is used for native maize being sown. And this, these sowing methods, unfortunately, have many limitations. And I'd like to speak to you about this part of Sinaloa, where we conserve the genes, where we store the genes, which can actually respond we can provide responses to the problems of growing maize, not just the problems that are seen in Mexico, but around the world. So if we take a, if we speak about diversity, well, in Sinaloa, we have different breeds of corn, and at national level, we have 59 different racial groups that have been identified. In Sinaloa, we have 14 of these different breeds, and you can see these at the moment on the screen. Now, these breeds are sown across Sinaloa, uh, in places that face great difficulties, limitations in terms of productivity, in terms of consumption as well, and distribution. And we also have biological problems. So there are many pests and diseases that the crops suffer while it is growing, but then also uh, pests and diseases during the storage phase. And then there are also other problems. There is There are high levels of rain. Sometimes there is drought. Sometimes there are high temperatures or low temperatures, which can cause stress to the crop. And also the, this, these crops are sown in places that are not very fertile. They don't have a lot of nutrition in the soil. It, there's, there's also very steep uh, uh, hilly land, and there is also no generational turnover, and there is there is no um, the, the generations, the older generations are not always able to pass on to younger generations, and many producers are elderly, farmers are elderly, and this means that we face a great deal of loss because the children or the grandchildren often do not continue sowing these types of maize, and these limitations mean that we set ourselves the task of saying we need to do something we need to do something to rescue to save and preserve these types of maize and therefore we set up a an invest a research project and that's what i'm doing for my phd for my doctorate and the objective is to collect from the north to the south across Sinaloa different forms different types of native maize and then to organize them Morphol agromorphologically, physiochemically, and nutritionally. And so in this project, the first part was to actually carry out the collection of the native maize on site in situ. And here you can see on the screen some of the images, some of the photos of us visiting producers, and they provide us with samples of their maize. So these are producers from across the state of Sinaloa. So what can we see in this first phase of what did we see in this first phase of collection of this research project? Well, many things. The first thing we saw was that we found breeds that were threatened with extinction of the 14 races that previous studies had identified across Sinaloa. We found that uh, there was only, we only found a few in the Northeast and then in Chapalote as well. We found very few of these breeds and that we also found partial and total losses of 
the sowing of native maize in in Concordia in Sinaloa. And these losses were suffered by some producers in specific seasons because of heavy rainfall and also strong winds. And this uh, prevented the people from planting and sowing the maize. But we also saw loss in terms of the genetic diversity of maize in the northern part of the state. And this for several reasons. Firstly, because of low levels of rainfall. And secondly, because... Um, improved and uh, bred uh, forms of maize were being sown. And we also saw problems because of storage. The storage being used for the grain was not in optimal conditions many on many occasions. Here we can see some of the storage techniques that are used some of the conservation techniques they're very varied but unfortunately these are not optimal conditions and therefore there are many losses there are many losses uh, for these grains and so we said we decided we have to rescue we have we have to save that biodiversity of maize that we have in Sinaloa how are we going to do it well we uh, went to CIMIT, which is the uh, National Institute for uh, Plant Breeding, and we also got in touch with the Seed Bank, the Gene Bank, and I was able to spend some time as a student there. I was able to spend some time at the um, Gem Plasm Bank, and we put forward a request for certain types of seeds so that we could carry out two actions. The first of these actions was to rescue these breeds, these breeds which were threatened. And so we wanted to collect the seeds and provide them to the producers so that they can continue carrying out their in situ conservation. And then the second action was, in order to meet that second objective, the re in the research project, we decided to use these materials, these breeds. We approached the gene bank and we asked them if they could be witnesses in uh, providing the seeds across uh, to producers across the state of Sinaloa. So how did we do this exactly? Well, we in order to return the seeds to the producers, the in terms of these breeds that are threatened with extinction, we collected the seeds for a few, just a few breeds. And then we had the, uh, we had the self-fertilization method that was used. And with the material that we gathered, we provide a small sample to the farmers from different places so that they could address the adaptation adaptability in their local conditions so they uh, did experiments in the field to see if their seeds would actually if these seeds would actually adapt to the local conditions and so here you can see the uh, farmers who had the um, seeds provided to them and then you can see some of them growing uh, their product their their produce their crops and this is uh, mainly in the south in Concordia in Sinaloa so then what did we do for the second action? That was characterizing the materials in terms of their agromorphological characteristics. And so we carried out a characterization process. We did a, we designed an experiment. We then asked for answers from, we uh, did a survey with farmers and you can see some of the collections that we did in Sinaloa and then we had seeds that were sown for 64 different types of materials that were provided by the gene bank. And then we carried out the characterization process. We defined the characteristics of these seeds. And then with these materials, we had uh, a small bank in the faculty and the faculty in, in the university in Sinaloa and we kept some seeds there and then we provided some farmers with seeds and uh, then with their harvest we tried to put together another uh, seed bank in Concordia so that the producers there can have access when they maybe lose their seeds maybe because 
the uh, because of climate change, or maybe sometimes their material is lost entirely for because of drought or because of some other um, factor. And so the idea was to have local access for the producers because small scale producers often have difficulties in directly accessing the national bank because maybe they don't have um, the right communication means, maybe they are not able to travel there, or often the producers simply are not aware, they don't even know that these centres exist where the genetic resources are stored. And with these materials, we were then able to raise awareness on the materials in Sinaloa that exist, and we work with uh, different producers, helping them to breed seeds, to improve their seeds, to adapt their seeds, and then the idea is that there is an exchange of native seeds with other producers. And now to wrap up, the uh, question we face is, why is it important to conserve the diversity of native maize? Well, for many reasons. Firstly, because we want sovereignty and self-sufficiency in terms of food for producers and communities and we also we believe that small-scale producers provide an added value to this and this helps them with their sustainability it helps them to survive in the long term and it allows them to sell the crop and have some income and also corn is essential maize is so essential there is no mexican who directly or indirectly does not consume uh this type of product it is essential it is a staple food in mexico so thank you and if you have any questions let me know thank you very much valeria what uh, great work that you do that's excellent thank you very much for sharing with Okay, you can raise your, your hand or write your question in the question and answer section. Uh, I We got a message from Alberto from CIMIT indicating that he cannot activate his microphone. Alberto, would you like, if you have something to say, you can write it on the question and answer. Or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you if you want to be unmuted. If you want, please raise your hand. Any other question or comment for Valeria? His hand is up, yeah. Okay, I cannot see it, sorry. Uh, let me unmute you. Yes, now I see it. Sorry, Alberto. Please go ahead. Greetings. Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending where you are. So I really wanted to thank Valeria for her presentation. In general, we find that it is the international centers that are at these events and uh, and we need the opportunity to explain what we do so it's great that it's the actually the users themselves who are able to explain how they interact with international institutes and in mexico in particular corn maize well there's so much diversity that it means that often the uh so the gene blanks, the gene banks um, cannot store everything. They don't have enough space, and we have to be humble enough to say that actually, what is in the seed, in the gene banks that doesn't represent or the full diversity, the full biodiversity in maize, and that's the case in Mexico, but also at global level as well. The real diversity is in the fields, and there is a great loss of. Uh, there's a great um, possibility of loss. There's a great uh, threat that there will be lots of losses. And uh, with CIMIT, what we can see is that they're distributing seeds. And I'd like to also speak about uh, the state of Yucatan, a different state in Mexico, where a lot of um, native material was lost. But thanks to the support from CIMIT, we were able to go back to the area and to um, bring back the seeds, to bring back the genetic material and sometimes they said well you give us only 250 seeds and that means that we have to expand the system so that we can distribute at a larger scale and some often 
uh, farmers don't have the right resources or the in institutions don't have the right resources to carry out the storage and distribution. So it's about storing seeds, but it's also about having resources so that we can increase the number of seeds that are being stored. And also we need to activate systems for the seeds. Unfortunately, I have, well, I have two roles. I am in charge of a, um, I'm in charge of a bank, uh, but I'm also a, a gene bank and I also work in the fields myself. And sometimes I, well, I wish I could share more knowledge on how you can actually distribute seeds correctly and how you can breed them. Because if you have 20 sessions or 20 activity, uh, sorry, if you have 20 different types of seeds being bred close to each other, then they will contaminate each other. There'll be a mixture of the pollen. And uh, so we need to work at a larger scale. We need to reach out to the communities. We need to give them these explanations. And that's why we need local seed banks. And it is there that we can offer support from the National Institute, but then the in situ conservation should take place. The national program should be doing this, working with universities and others. And so that's why the example of Valeria has been successful and a big round of applause for her. Thank you. Greetings, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for this uh, for this presentation and the question. So one doubt I had in terms of Mexico and in terms of Sinaloa is that, well, uh, there I have two doubts, really. Firstly, the distribution of seeds and the articulation, the links with uh, organizations, is that done uh, with farmers? Is it done through farmers' organizations? Are there relationships that are established or have you had to create a new relationship, a new partnership? Uh, and then in addition to that, is there, um, is there an agreement with the producers? And... Uh, and so do you have specific agreements with organizations as such, farmer organizations? Thank you. Over to Valeria to answer that question. Thank you, Raphael. And um, so this is, uh, we don't have specific agreements with organizations, but rather it's the research project that I am using for my thesis and also the Autonomous University of Sinaloa, where we are carrying out this project and it's research basically so for that reason we don't actually um we're trying to raise awareness uh among the producers so we're seeing that there's a lack of communication it's a uh, difficulties in terms of access in certain areas and uh, many people don't know about the seed banks that exist and so when i did my missions to collect the grain across Sinaloa, I realized that a lot of the material, a lot of the breeds were being lost. And so producers came back to us and they asked us if, how we could transfer some seeds to them, how we could pass on some seeds to them. And that's why we decided to um, turn towards Simit, the June Bank. And there was no, no specific agreement. There was no signing of an agreement, but rather we said the, seen, the seeds will be provided by Simit. They didn't actually know, the farmers didn't know what Simit was, but we explained it. And also we said that they have the commitment to continue sowing these forms of maize and they should continue breeding these there and they should not lose these types of maize. And so we worked with those who then harvested those seeds and then got them to pass these on again in turn to other producers. And so we saw that uh, 
or if there were if there was drought or flooding then um there we had we would have the largest number of producers as possible uh breeding or uh producing but they, we didn't have any specific written agreement between uh, or with the uh, farmers. I hope that answers your question, Raphael. Raphael says, yes, thank you very much. And congratulations once again for your work. And uh, and I hope you're able to continue. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Raphael. So now we're going...